I want to talk about three things in this uh, next half hour. The first thing is I want to um, argue that uh, the food industry, and in particular the agricultural industry, has entered a new era. We'll talk a little bit about the... Um, there we are, we're going. Talk a little bit about the second um, era, but I really want to focus on the third era. The second thing I want to talk about is that the solution to dealing with the issues that the industry is going to face in the third era are based on what I call the three S's. Science, scale, and supply chain um, integration. And then finally, I want to set out a vision for an industry which is going to be based on science and technology, highly capitalized, and offering well-rewarded careers to the people within it. Think about the industry, really, <coughs> as employing people in white coats rather than smocks, because that's the future of agriculture. We just listened to a talk on the agritech strategy, which, for my sins, I do sit on the technology board. What my colleague didn't tell you was that the greatest handicap against that policy is the common agricultural policy. It's a policy which is in direct conflict with everything that is trying to be done by the ag tech strategy. And until that is recognized, any progress is going to be relatively slow and based over a long period of time. I'll give you some hints as to why that is in a few minutes. I don't know why that is. Uh, why doesn't that move on? Oh, there we are. Here we are. Behind me here is some data on global cereal prices. And you'll see that from about 2006 on, there seemed to be some sort of step change in um, this uh, long-term trend. I'm interested in cereal prices because they underpin the whole of the agricultural industry. But if I superimpose on this graph all commodity, uh, food commodity prices, you can see there's a very high um, correlation for very good reasons. An awful lot of cereals go down animal throats. They affect um, you know, areas of land that are grown to crops and things like that. Now, although it may not be as clear as I'd like, up to about 2003 or thereabouts, and going back a lot further, agricultural prices tended to be falling. We were in an era, era where, as a result, really, of the Green Revolution, back in the 1960s, productivity and um, better management was driving um, lower prices. That technology um, has run its course. And um, what we saw in the uh, middle of the uh, last decade was a step change up in prices, which we'll come to talk about in a minute. And it is this new, higher, more volatile price era that um, we now um, reside in and which we have to face up to. And I'm sorry to say that so far I don't really think that politicians um, have uh, stepped up to this. They talk about it privately, but in public they're rather frightened of talking about the consequences of what this implies. Here's another chart a little nearer home. This is retail food prices I've, um, in the UK. I've only drawn it from 2007, so you can see it. But if I went back about 30 or 40 years, it was the case that during that period, food prices, retail food prices, always, with one or two exceptions, always rose at a lower rate than prices generally. In other words, food was getting cheaper, people were able to spend a smaller proportion of their income on food, and that allowed for all manner of changes, not only in the rest of the economy, but also in the food industry, where people were prepared you know, to be more experimental, to um, you know, eat out a lot more, etc. Now, we've entered an era where food prices are rising faster than prices generally, and this is likely to continue. It might be that they'll move a little more in line in the future, but we are not, we are not going to see a return to the trend of the last 40 um, years or so, not without the help of science and technology. Why are um, these prices rising? Essentially, it comes down to demand. The FAO say that between now and 2050, we've got to increase the world's production of food by 70%. And there are many experts who think that's on the low side. And people say, well, population's growing. You know, we're going to be 9.2 billion or whatever by uh, 2050. 
and of course more of them will be living in uh, urban areas, um, etc. But I think the real cause of this demand is the rising incomes of people in developed world. That's what's really um, driving up the um, uh, prices of food. And I'm going to look at some of the problems in a minute. But essentially, we have a duty in this country here, and indeed in Europe, and in those parts of the world that can increase food production, to get on and do it. A lot of talk about well, you know, maybe we should, uh, you know, take a different view in this country. We should just focus on, uh, you know, looking after the countryside, cut back on our production. I think this is morally wrong. I think we have great opportunity here to contribute to the uh, increasing demand for food in the world. And as you'll see, in many parts of the world, many people are going to have a lot of difficulty producing the food they need. There is this point of view that says, well, in order to solve this problem, what we really need to do is to eat less meat. In fact, the organic lobby never tell you, but their only way of solving their problem um, is that we should eat a great deal less meat. We should largely become vegetarian. I don't hear them spelling it out very often to, um, to people. And I think to go to people in China who are just coming out of poverty. And the first thing that happens when you come out of poverty and uh, your income begins to go from a dollar a day to two, three, four, five dollars a day, the first thing that changes is your diet. You eat more meat, you eat more dairy products, both of which depend greatly on grain, and you eat more vegetables. Are we seriously, are we seriously saying to these people in this part of the, in the developing part of the world, are we really saying to them, well, you can't, uh, you can't live your dream. You really can't improve your diet in the way you want it. You know, you've really got to uh, take a step back. It's not on. It's not politically possible. It's just a fantasy. Here's a graph that shows you what happens to me. I could draw a similar diagram for dairy products. Um, but this will make my point for me. As people become richer on the horizontal axis, as their per capita income rises, what you'll see is meat consumption um, uh, goes up. Very roughly in the left-hand side of that graph there. I've only put a selected number of countries on there, otherwise it would just be a great big green splodge. Uh, but half the world's population are on that left-hand side of the graph as you look at it. And what we can expect, reasonably expect, over the coming years as they continue to develop and as the incomes of their populations continue to rise, they will be moving roughly along that orange line there. They will be greatly increasing their consumption of meat, dairy products, and as I said, vegetables. Somehow or other, we're going to have to meet the demands for this food. And if you're a chicken, I think you require about 2.5 kilograms of grain per kilogram of meat and up to about 7 kilograms um, for beef. So if we are to meet this problem, we have to produce a great deal more grain in the world. But here's a problem. Yields are slowing down. I said the... Uh, Green Revolution of the uh, you know, 1960s seems to have uh, run its course. Here I've put up global cereal yields, and they're a great deal lower, of course, than the uh, level in this country here. But if I were to draw or put up a graph of wheat yields in this country, you'd see that the trend has flattened more than it has in the rest of the world. We've reached some sort of plateau in Europe. Yields aren't really growing anymore. And that's a big problem because back in the beginning of uh, this millennium, we had something like about 0.26 hectares of land for every person in the world. By 2050, that will have dropped to 0.16 of a hectare. The solution, if we are going to meet the demands, is glaringly obvious. It has to be a substantial rise in productivity. But we face an awful lot of challenges where that's concerned. First of all, why do we need productivity? Because as I said the land area is declining. I mean, we can go on cutting down rainforests I suppose to try and provide a bit more. But the FAO think that if we ignore rainforests, you might over the next 30, 40 years get another 5 to 7% increase in the agricultural land area but really be realistic we've got to think of doing this without increasing the land area 
Okay, next problem, of course, is that the same forces that are driving up the demand for food are also driving up the prices of other commodities, and in particular things like oil, energy. Energy is a big input into fertilizers, and it's also a direct um, cost for farmers. So somehow or other, we've got to increase this um, productivity while at the same time reducing the amount of energy in, per unit of output in farming. Agriculture, I think, uses about 70% of the world's fresh water. You know, there are many parts of the world where water, fresh water, is becoming scarce. India is a first-class example of that at the moment. Somehow or other, we've got to produce this extra food using a lot less water per unit um, of um, output. All these are measures of productivity. The first one, if you like, is the traditional land or yield productivity. We've got to get um, non-renewable resource productivity up. We've got to get water um, productivity um, up. Then we face climate change. You know, not for me to uh, say what the world will look like in terms of climate in uh, 30 years time, but I think, or I believe, I am persuaded that in least climate change is leading to more extreme weather patterns and we know that crops do not like extreme weather patterns. They don't like a great deal of heat, they don't like a great deal um, of water, um, they don't like um, drought. So we've got to find crops or ways of producing crops under more stressful conditions. And finally, of course, we're all environmentalists now. There is going to be regulations and controls on what farming can do with its land, and um, they're going to be expected to deliver um, public goods um, into the future. To my mind, if you accept that these are the challenges that face the industry, the only way in which they're going to be solved is by relying on science and technology and the Royal Society produced a report a few years ago now where they coined the phrase sustainable intensification. In other words, I interpret that as meaning we've got to greatly increase the output from the land while lowering the per unit use of things like fertilizers, energy and water. Now, what's the problem with that? It's, I suppose, the elephant in the room, really. The common agricultural policy is really a policy designed, for, and failing, but designed to keep small, I would say inefficient, not very well-educated farmers in business. Many of them hang on by their fingertips. How many people in this room are aware of the fact that the grand figures you were given for the... Um, value added in agriculture, most of it, 85% of it, comes from just 20% of the farms. Most farms are highly inefficient. Most farms produce very little. Yet they are supported by the um, common agricultural policy that desperately tries to keep them in business and in keeping them in business places a handicap on larger farms. Most science and technological developments are not scale neutral. Maybe things like GM crops are, but most modern technologies rely on large scale farming. You need larger scale, not only lowers your costs of production, but it provides you with the funds to invest in these new technologies and it also provides you with a volume of output over which to spread the costs. I have never yet heard anyone provide a convincing explanation as to how small-scale farms hanging on by their fingertips are going to invest in these new, more productive, sustainable technologies. There's a mismatch which needs to be thought about and uh, I've thought about it. And I think they've got to go and we've got to push the industry much more towards larger farms. If you want a more productive industry, producing food more sustainably, then the future lies with much larger scale farms here, across the world. And that will be to the benefit of everyone. Now I realise there are lots of problems in developing countries, etc. Um, but even in places like Africa, you see the progress has been made by large-scale industrial farms. That's where the future lies, 
and we are no exception here. Take a look at the advantages of um, a large farm. Agriculture is no different than any other process industry. The new knowledge, the science-based um, knowledge, is transferred into production via one of three routes. It either goes through technology, bigger machines. These days, of course, uh, information is uh, at the heart of a lot of these uh, machinery. It goes through genetics, or it goes through management. We're rather weak on management um, in agriculture. The effect of these three routes when combined is to increase productivity, not only in terms of um, output from the land, but also, I argue, in terms of non-renewable resources. One of the weirdest things these days is everyone talks about sustainability as though it's something new. Well, it's certainly true that there's greater concern about um, you know, the lack or the pressure on non-renewable resources. But, but ec economics has always been about sustainability. It has always been about getting more from less. That's what sustainability is. That's what efficiency is. And that's why we should focus, above all else, on the most efficient form of agricultural production. I spent many years in agriculture. Of course, there's always one or two bad eggs. I have never, never come across a farmer, big, big farmer, industrial scale farmer, who doesn't also look after his land. If you want your land looked after, you need someone who's a good manager, you need someone who has the funds to spend, and large farmers spend much more on conservation than their smaller counterparts, and you have to have someone who understands, who has the education. Large farmers are good for production and good for the countryside. And of course, as far as consumers are concerned, what we want from this efficiency is to return to those trends of the last 40 years whereby food prices rise at a slower rate than prices generally. So, if we have a smaller number of larger, more professional farms, I think a number of things follow from this. We talk about supply chain integration rather glibly. You know, we say, well, other industries do it. Agriculture has to do it. There's a world of difference between trying to integrate an atomistic farming sector into a supply chain and the more sort of oligopolistic um, structures that um, exist in other industries. If we had a smaller number of larger scale, better managed, better funded farms, you would find it a great deal easier to achieve supply chain integration with all its um, benefits. And um, I've already argued that I think these farms would deliver a better environment, so that doesn't worry me at all. And I think, um, bearing in mind where we are here, I also think they are the sort of farms that are going to offer better careers to people. As I said at the beginning, you know, I think the future really is going to be data management, highly skilled people. If you want them into agriculture, you're going to have to pay them more money. I was on the Agricultural Wages Board for years. I don't think it's changed very much since I left. It used to be that the average agricultural wage was about 75% of the non-agricultural wage. Well, that isn't going to attract sort of bright people into the industry. You've got to have farms that are capable of offering salaries and careers that are commensurate with other leading sectors of the economy. And quite frankly, small-scale farms can't, well, they don't employ many people anyway, do they? If we're really after supply chain integration, here's one way to um, look at it. We're interested in the raw materials. That's uh, uh, where agriculture comes from. We've got to add value to those raw materials. That's what the supply chain does. And we are interested in sustainability in all senses of the word. <coughs> what we want is not only ecological sustainability, we need the sustainability of the industry. You need profitable businesses capable of developing themselves and surviving. If we have relatively small number of large-scale farms, as I say, I think they are much easier to 
to organize, in fact, I think they would have greater willingness to organize themselves into sort of coherent groups that can integrate um, more effectively within the supply chain. And just think of some of the advantages that arise in that situation there. First of all, to the extent, that's why people talk about it, to the extent that there is greater integration between the providers of the raw material and the next stage processors and manufacturers, so there is longer, longer term security. There is reduced risk. The more volatile, the more uncertain your market, the more difficult it is for long term planning, the more difficult it is to engage in costly investment. So we're going to find some way of getting the volatility down, getting the risks down. And one way of doing that is by integration between, or greater integration between buyers and sellers at the raw material stage. If you build a longer term relationship with these raw material suppliers who are dedicated to you, you can more easily improve quality you can more easily ensure that production techniques are being carried on in a way that you think as the buyer as the food chain is appropriate and overall there is a general improvement in quality finally of course information is incredibly important here shared much better between integrated groups rather than the rather vague way information is communicated at the moment then we move on to the value adding stage. Much easier to uh, introduce pricing and quality schemes if you um, are integrated. By being able to plan, by being able to change quality, etc., you're going to bring about production efficiencies in the value um, adding um, stage and you're going to encourage innovation. And finally, of course, you're going to greatly reduce waste and better stock control. All these things, sources of um, value. And then finally, moving down, as it were, towards um, the customers, you're going to be able, much more credibly, to be able to say to people, we have a transparent, explicit uh, commitment to um, sustainability because we know the people very, who produce our food, we work closely with them. I mean, you're told that at the moment, but the truth is a long way from that. Um, people um, want greater differentiation, greater variety um, in their food. Much easier to supply that when you have dedicated suppliers who work with you to develop new products and um, uh, new processes. By working with the food chain, rather than trying to take advantage of every short-term opportunity, you become a better citizen. You become you know, someone who's adding not only economic value, but social value um, to your chain. And as a result, we have enhanced social welfare. So from whatever direction I look at it, larger scale industrialized farming offers enormous benefits to the um, food industry um, in the future. So, to recap. First thing to grasp is the agricultural industry has entered a new era. If you want to know what the other two were after the war, there was an era of producing more food. That era finished around about the middle of the 70s. Uh, then we thought our problem was oversupply and we drifted over the next 25 years or so into a whole set of policies which really downplayed productivity, elevated um, all manner of um, environmental schemes and uh, but of course really the idea was just to keep the inefficient um, um, in business. Perhaps that didn't matter when we thought we weren't short of food. Perhaps it wasn't an issue that we needed to care very much about. Now we do. The world has changed in a way that people had not really anticipated. They never thought that China and the developing world would develop as fast as it has. And um, perhaps they underestimated how rapidly the world's raw material, uh, non-renewable resources, um, would start to um, deplete. Anyway, we've entered this new era and we need new policies and we need new attitudes for it. I've explained why um, prices are higher. So we won't dwell on that. Despite the common agricultural policy, despite something 
in excess of 55 billion euro per year, been largely wasted on supporting inefficiency, it will continue. So not going for the next seven years and it'll probably go way beyond that. What is happening across Europe is the structural change, you can't prevent it, all it can do is slow it down. Slowly but surely production is being concentrated on larger farms. Slowly but surely the industry is moving towards those large scale productions. The trouble is of course it is greatly slowed down and in the process we are sending the wrong signals to uh, the science and technology houses. They would change their um, views if suddenly they saw opportunities for much greater markets in terms of science and technology. Um, and uh, basically, what I'm saying is, we are missing a great opportunity. We cannot deliver all that we want in terms of science and technology while we have a policy which supports inefficiency. They too are in direct conflict. I don't care what anyone says. That, I believe, is quite fundamental. The irony is this, of course, Previous speaker told you that um, productivity growth has slowed down here. I think if you look at the figures, you'll find the others are just catching up faster. We used to be ahead and they've got greater opportunities. But of course, you eventually begin productivity, like yield growth, does begin to slow down. What you need then is a new technology or science, a new era. You know, the benefits we've had for the last 30 years really came forward in the sort of 60s and 70s. And we've been working through those, but it's, you know, your S-shaped curve. It takes off and then begins to level off. What we're waiting for is the next big technological um, advance. And I think those 20% of British farmers who produce 85% of the output are in a very strong position um, to um, take up this um, challenge. You look across Europe and around the world, we have top 20%, some of the best farmers in the world. We have at the um, base of our food supply chain you know, one of the most efficient industries, you know, in the world. We should encourage and help them, not hold them back. And we do. You know, when someone comes forward with a plan to spend, invest, whether it's dairy or pigs or whatever, and bigger things, first thing that happens is there's an almighty protest movement. You know, um, and it's often long before anyone's ever thought about the other facts. It was just, I remember on the Nocton dairy thing, you know, people were asking me to write reports against it before they even knew what it involved. It was just, we, we just don't want it, not in our backyard. Sustainability is the future. We have to think about not only biological inputs, you know, here's some of the um, areas that um, we've got to raise soil productivity, we've got to get all that big machinery out there with all the latest in terms of you know, GPS and all the rest of it. That's the future of farming and that is the vision that I leave with you. Thank you very much. <laughs>